Hello, and thank you for checking out this audio revision guide from MrAllsopHistory.com. You can visit my website to download free history revision podcasts on this topic and a whole load of others. In this podcast, we're going to focus on the causes and consequences of the Iran-Iraq War 1980 to 1988. When the Iraqi president Saddam Hussein declared war on Iran in September 1980, he dubbed it the Whirlwind War because he expected Iran to be defeated relatively swiftly. However, the war persisted for nearly eight long and bloody years with an estimated half a million soldiers killed and an equivalent number of civilians. This podcast will focus on three key issues. Firstly, the different causes of the war, then the nature of how it was fought, and finally, the consequences of the war for each nation. Having secured the presidency of Iraq in 1979, Saddam Hussein was keen to consolidate the power of his minority Sunni Muslim Ba'ath government. However, at almost exactly the same time, Ayatollah Khomeini came to power through the Iranian Revolution, installing a Shiite Muslim theocracy in Iraq's neighbour. For details of the rise of Saddam and of the Iranian Revolution, you can listen to my previous podcasts in this series. One of the key causes of the Iran-Iraq War was that shortly after the revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini called for the overthrow of Saddam's regime in Iraq. Unsurprisingly, this was met with hostility in Iraq, especially after Shia militants assassinated 20 party officials in April 1980. This devastating attack built upon previous localised uprisings against the Ba'ath Party which the Iraqi government believed had been both supported and encouraged by Iran. The war wasn't just an attempt to stop Iran's threatening behaviour, however. Both countries relied on oil exports to generate the vast majority of their national income. But Iran's extensive access to the Persian Gulf vastly outstripped Iraq's tiny coastline. A particularly sore point for Iraq was Iranian access to the Shat al-Arab waterway, which Iraq had reluctantly allowed Iran to use in the Algiers Agreement of 1975. A second cause of the war was therefore Iraq's need to push Iran back and to take control of the waterway to secure their own oil exports. If the army was successful, they might even increase their own oil reserves by capturing some of Iran's oil fields in the surrounding areas. Saddam knew that achieving these aims through a short and decisive war against Iran would expand Iraq's influence, power and prestige in the Middle East. However, timing was critical. The third reason Saddam therefore began the war in September 1980 specifically was because Iran was poorly prepared for war at the time. Its army had recently been purged of officers and soldiers loyal to the former Shah and so was believed to be militarily weak and demoralised. Furthermore, the country's economy was in tatters as a result of Western countries boycotting trade due to the ongoing hostage crisis at the American Embassy. In order to answer the key questions in the exam, you need to be able to explain these three key reasons for the outbreak of the war. Whether you are looking at an explain why question about the causes, or whether you're considering an analytical question in which you assess how important a particular factor was, you must be able to give a range of reasons that the war broke out. Therefore, you should remember the key points. Iran's threat to Saddam's regime, the opportunity to gain territory and oil, and timing. You need to provide evidence for each point, 
and explain why they contributed to the war. Point, evidence, explanation. The Iran-Iraq war raged for an unprecedented eight years, making it the longest Middle Eastern war of the 20th century. Despite Saddam's expectations of a quick and easy victory, Iran mobilised its revolutionary population who voluntarily streamed to the front lines and pushed the Iraqis back to their own border. Additionally, Iran's superior navy deployed into the Persian Gulf and blockaded Iraq's ports, meaning that Iraq was unable to export any of its oil or import badly needed supplies by sea. Of the foreign major powers that were involved in the Iran-Iraq war, only Syria sided with Iran. The issue was more a case of my enemy's enemy is my friend because of Syria's rivalry with Iraq. Syria's most significant contribution to the Iranian war effort was in shutting off Iraq's main oil pipeline that ran from the oil fields of Kirkuk to the Syrian port of Banias on the Mediterranean. The closure of this pipeline is estimated to have cost Iraq 5 billion US dollars per month, which would have made the war impossible to continue if it wasn't for foreign support for Iraq. The role of other foreign powers was therefore crucial to maintaining the Iraqi war effort, with virtually the entire Arab world throwing its support behind Saddam. Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain and indeed the United Arab Emirates all contributed money and weapons to the Iraqi war effort. Jordan's land border with Iraq was also vitally important, as that provided a route for imports and exports that avoided the blockaded Persian Gulf. Beyond the Arab states, France and the USSR became the biggest suppliers of weapons to Iraq. Amazingly, considering the ongoing Cold War and the fact that the Soviet Union was already supporting Saddam, the USA also came in on the side of Iraq by providing intelligence information from US satellites. They also provided naval escorts through the blockaded Persian Gulf to get Iraqi imports and exports moving again. The Iran-Iraq war finally came to an end on July 20th, 1988, when a ceasefire known as UN Resolution 598 was universally approved. Ever since the earliest weeks of the war, attacks on civilians had been a major part of the tactics of both sides and became known as the War of the Cities. In the final months of the war, these attacks became more and more brutal, with Iran fearing an all-out chemical attack against their cities when an estimated 2,000 civilians were killed after Iraqi planes dropped poison on the northwestern town of Oshnavir. When even more civilians died after cyanide and other poisonous gases were dropped at the start of July, Ayatollah Khomeini reluctantly accepted the UN ceasefire. The consequences of the war were, in many ways, similar for both Iraq and Iran. Primarily, neither country had succeeded in its primary aim of a military defeat of the other. Indeed, most historians and military analysts say that the entire eight-year conflict ended in a stalemate by simply returning the two countries to their pre-war position. The economies of both nations had been destroyed in the process as a result of damage to their oil infrastructure and the military expense of the war. Each side had spent an estimated 500 billion US dollars and the war had slowed their economic development to such an extent that recovery was significantly affected. In an Iranian radio broadcast announcing the ceasefire, Ayatollah Khomeini expressed immense unhappiness at having drunk the poison chalice by approving the truce. However, his reputation survived intact, 
Iran had maintained its Shiite theocracy. And at Khomeini's funeral just a year later, 12 million people turned out to see his body go by. In Iraq, meanwhile, support for the government declined. Despite the extensive systems of control and terror wielded by Saddam Hussein, riots and strikes occurred throughout the country. A key problem was that the army, who had previously been used to repress opposition, was itself upset at the outcome of the war. Some soldiers specifically blamed Saddam himself for the failure to defeat Iran, and a number of suspected traitors were executed in the years that followed. The effect on the civilian population was also significant. The cost of the war had used up funds previously allocated to social welfare, education and health care, resulting in an increase in infant mortality and a reduction in life expectancy. Despite promises to improve the situation after the war, and Iraq's eye-watering debts of over 130 billion US dollars, Saddam continued to instead invest heavily in weapons that he later used in his invasion of Kuwait in 1990. You can find out more about this in my next podcast. The overall impact of the war on both countries was catastrophic. If you are asked about the consequences of the conflict, you could say that in many ways both Iran and Iraq experienced the same devastating economic and social effects, as long as you give specific examples relating to each country. However, whereas the Iranian government managed to maintain its popular support, the people of Iraq had begun to question their leadership. <laughs>